clinical session uh, for patients uh, who, who have conditions of aging. Um, and really that is the, the discussion of the day. Uh, as the video highlighted, uh, getting old is uh, not always a, a, what shall I say, a smooth experience. It can sometimes be stormy. And a part of the storminess comes from not just problems of brain, there are also problems of mind and problems of the body, all of which come together as we get older. And that really is what we're going to be talking about together today. Why have we chosen this topic uh, to speak about? We are a rapidly aging society. Um, what countries like France and, and Germany and, and America did uh, in a short, uh, in, a, in a long span of 100 years in terms of the aging population, countries in Asia like India and China will do in 20 years. So people are living longer and when you live longer, you become more prone to these disorders of aging. So there is a real problem in population terms and that's one of the reasons why we are concerned. Uh, we are also, you, yesterday I was at a public policy discussion um, with some very eminent people, uh, including Dr. Samya Swaminathan, who heads the WHO research. Uh, and one of the points that they have all been making repeatedly is that as a country, as a healthcare system, as a society, we are not really prepared for this aging population. We have not taken any enough steps to prepare ourselves for this aging population and that's something else that we need to be talking about. And the third, of course, while we are developing and developing fast in so many ways, our lifespan uh, in India still is about 10 years below the average lifespan of the US citizen and about 15 years below the lifespan of the Japanese citizen. So uh, we do have uh, areas which we need to, to catch up. So why don't you start by telling us, uh, Mother, what got you interested in brain aging as a, as a career and something that you're putting your life into? Very good. First of all, thanks a lot, Krish, for this uh, kind and maybe excessively effusive uh, introduction. Uh, I don't know how deserving I am of all the nice things you said, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, participate in this uh, public engagement activity. So thank you once more for this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity. So how I got interested in brain aging, I think, uh, goes back to um, school and, uh, school and uh, the later part of my 10th, 11th and 12th. So I grew up in a, in a household where science was a way of life. So both my parents are scientists, uh, my mom's here. Uh, so my mom's a, a chemistry professor, my father's a physiologist. So science was always a way of, uh, way of life uh, at home. And uh, as I came to doing my 11th and 12th, uh, I always uh, was interested in doing medicine as well. Uh, but all uh, during the time that I was growing up, my parents always had this, uh, this bias where they always used to remark that physicians will never make good scientists. And that if you want to do good science, you know, you have to do science, you can't become a physician. And this always used to kind of bother me a little bit. And so, once I finished uh, doing my uh, medicine, I got interested uh, in disorders of the brain, understanding how the mind works. And so, I decided that uh, for me to actually ask those kinds of fundamental questions, I need to get a solid grounding in scientific methodology. Um, I had uh, an opportunity to do that uh, at the Indian Institute of Science when I was doing my internship. And that really sparked my interest. Uh, and so, like you said, I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to go to Oxford to study neuroscience. And since then, uh, it's been one interesting question after the other. Uh, and I think at the heart of much of what we do is uh, this interest and desire to understand how the brain works, how the mind works, uh, why does it look so well when it works, why does it feel so badly when it fails. Uh, and so it's been, uh, it's been a continuing uh, journey since, uh, since those initial years. Thank you, and I think it, it's been quite a journey till now, and I'm sure it's going to be an exemplary journey uh, going forward. One of the things that has brought Madhav to India, and I'll be failing in my duty if I don't mention this, uh, Madhav is a T.S. Srinivasan visiting professor at, at Nimhans, 
for a six week period for two consecutive years running, endowed by the TBS group. And that's one of the reasons why we have the privilege of having Madhav in India for some time, collaborating with colleagues in the management. One of the reasons why we are able to have Madhav here with us uh, today. So let me ask you first, Madhav. So all of us are interested in this. What's happening to my brain as I get older? And how is my brain different, say, from my wife's brain? Uh, you know, and how is that going to age different? So I'll ignore the second question because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> so I, uh, so it's a fantastic question. So what happens uh, to our uh, brains when we age? So this is something that uh, an activist have uh, asked, you know, more than a hundred years ago. Uh, it's a question that we still do not really answer completely. Uh, what we do know is uh, that as individuals age, uh, their cognitive abilities decline. Uh, the structure of the brain changes in profound uh, ways. And we think that as individuals age, this combination of alterations in brain structure and function contribute to declines in cognitive performance, uh, abnormalities in emotional perception, changes in sensory perception and so on and so forth. All of these can fall within what we call the normal spectrum of aging and that's happening to us as we speak, so to every one of us. That's a question that we don't understand well enough. But on top of that, we do not understand why some individuals leave that spectrum of normal aging and move towards normal peace in brain behavior diseases like dementias, late life depression, uh, and so on and so forth. This is my work. I think it's, it's fading a little bit. Can we get a hand mic? Yeah. I think we can get the on one. So, um, as I said, so there are two questions here that we don't understand fully. Really. What is it uh, that defines a spectrum of normal cognitive aging? And what it is that moves certain individuals from the normal spectrum to diseases uh, such as uh, dementias. We know from large studies, including studies that we've done ourselves, that as individuals age, so if you take a group of individuals 65 and above, and follow them over time by doing serial brain scans, you easily make profound changes. One of the changes that we have observed is um, the brain The brain's uh, thickness, the cortical thickness of the brain, so the cortex is the superficial uh, layer of the brain, the gray matter of the brain uh, that is composed of neurons, uh, that the cortical thickness of the brain declines as we age. Uh, in individuals who are normal, this decline is about 5 ml uh, of cortical thickness lost every year. So 5 ml would be about a teaspoonful of volume of brain that's lost every year after 65 years of age. As individuals transition into problems like cognitive impairment or dementias, that volume loss accelerates tremendously. So you go from one teaspoonful of brain volume that's being lost to three to five teaspoonfuls of brain volume that are lost every year as individuals age. So I think all of the evidence that we have suggests that as individuals age, there are profound alterations in brain structure and function, <coughs> into profound and very detectable uh, changes uh, in the way uh, people function and are able to carry on activities of daily living. Thank you. So, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a spoonful of sugar can make the medicine go down. A spoonful of brain loss can make your cognition go down. Uh, and that seems to happen regularly to people as they get older. Are there differences between men and women? And are there differences between cultures? Excellent question. So yes, so sex differences have been well studied uh, in understanding both brain structure and function. And sex differences in cognition uh, are especially interesting. So our group has done uh, some work uh, in, this, in this area. So as I'm sure you know, your brain is different from your wife's brain. Uh, men and women uh, have unique cognitive abilities, unique strengths and weaknesses. So a lot of the data that we have collected comes from a longitudinal study that uh, has been in place in the United States since 1958. Uh, this is called the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And we have tested uh, well over 3,000 individuals with very detailed cognitive measures. 
and very striking sex differences emerge. Uh, so men seem to have uh, particular strengths in visual spatial abilities. Women seem to be able to outperform men at baseline in almost every other cognitive uh, domain, including memory, uh, language, executive function, and processing speed. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, because I, uh, I, I want to please your wife, uh, or please uh, the, the other women uh, in, in, in the audience. But this, is, uh, this has been shown many, many times, that women seem to outperform men in virtually every cognitive uh, domain except perhaps visual spatial skills. And as they age, it looks as if men decline much more rapidly than women do in virtually every cognitive uh, domain. So that's another very striking uh, sex difference. So together it seems to suggest uh, that females seem to have more cognitive resilience uh, as the aging process uh, evolves. And gross culture, that's another uh, very interesting question. So there's uh, high quality data from European and North American populations. This is a question that started getting more and more uh, attention. So there's a large uh, international consortium. Uh, it's called the COSMIC uh, study. It's called uh, the cohort to study memory in an international consortium. So this is uh, a data set that's composed of more than 45,000 individuals over five continents and 15 different countries, including India. And what they have studied is how do risk factors change with individuals age across cultures. And by and large, there seems to be uniformity across cultures. The one thing that's striking is certain risk factors such as diabetes and hypertension and 